visited on her innocent child, entrusted him soon after his birth to the care of a faithful servant, with instructions to expose him in a certain field, and there leave him, feeling assured that the divine offspring of Zeus would not long remain without the protections of the gods. Soon after the child had thus been abandoned, Hera and Athena happened to pass by the field and were attracted by its cries. Moved with compassion, Athena carried him to Alcamene and entreated her kind offices on behalf of the poor little foundling. Alcamene at once recognized her child and joyfully accepted the charge. Soon afterwards, Hera, to her extreme annoyance, discovered whom she had nursed and became filled with jealous rage. She now sent two venomous snakes into the chamber of Alcamene, which crept, unperceived by the nurses, to the cradle of the sleeping child. He awoke with a cry, and grasping a snake in each hand, strangled them both. Alcamene and her attendant, to whom the cry of the child had awakened, rushed to the cradle, where, to their astonishment and terror, they beheld the two reptiles dead in the hands of the infant. Amphitryon was also attracted to the chamber by this commotion, and when he beheld this astounding proof of supernatural strength, he declared that the child must have been sent to him as a special gift from God. Sent to him as a special gift from Zeus. He accordingly consulted the famous seer, Tiresias, who now informed him of the divine origin of his stepson and prognosticated for him a great and distinguished future. When Amphitryon heard the noble destiny which awaited the child entrusted to his care, he resolved to educate him in a manner worthy of his future career. At a suitable age, he himself taught him how to guide a chariot, Eurydice, how to handle the bow, Odolycus, dexterity in wrestling and boxing, and Castor, the art of armed warfare, whilst Linus, the son of Apollo, instructed him in music and letters. Heracles was an apt pupil, but undue harshness was intolerable to his high spirit, and old Linus, who was not the gentlest of teachers, one day corrected him with blows, whereupon the boy angrily took up his lyre, and with one stroke of his powerful arm, killed his tutor on the spot. Apprehensive lest the ungovernable temper of the young might again involve him in similar acts of violence, Amphitryon sent him into the country, where he placed him under the charge of one of his most trusted herdsmen. Here, as he grew up to manhood, his extraordinary stature and strength became the wonder and admiration of all beholders. His aim whether his spear
Zeus. <laughs> 
his way there, he craved food and shelter of a centaur named Follis, who received him with generous hospitality. When Heracles expressed his surprise that such a well-furnished board wine should be wanting, his host explained that the wine cellar was the common property of all centaurs, and that it was against the rules for a cask to be broached, except all were present to partake in it. By dint of persuasion, however, Heracles prevailed on his kind host to make an exception in his favor. But the powerful, luscious odor of the good old wine soon spread over the mountains and brought large numbers of centaurs to the spot all armed with huge rocks and fire trees. Heracles drove them back with fire brands, and then, following up his victory, pursued them with his arrows as far as Malaya, where they took refuge in the cave of the kind old centaur, Chiron. Chiron. Unfortunately, however, as Heracles was shooting at them with his poison darts, one of these pierced the knee of Chiron. <laughs> when Heracles discovered that it was the friend of his early days that he had wounded, he was overcome with sorrow and regret. He at once extracted the arrow and anointed the wound with a salve, the virtue of which had been taught him by Chiron himself. But all his efforts were unavailing of the Hydra was incurable, and so great was the agony of Chiron that at the intercession of Heracles, death was sent him by the gods, for otherwise being immortal, he would have been doomed to endless suffering. Follas, who had so kindly entertained Heracles, also perished by means of one of these arrows which he had extracted from the body of a dead centaur. While he was quietly examining it, astonished that so small and insignificant an object should be productive of such a serious results, the arrow fell upon his foot and fatally wounded him. Full of grief at this untoward event, Heracles buried him with due honors and set out to chase the boar. With loud shouts and terrible cries, he first drove him out of the thickets into the deep snow drifts which covered the summit of the mountain, and then, having at length wearied him with his incessant pursuit, he captured the exhausted animal, bound him with a rope, and brought him alive to Messina. After slaying Eurystheus commanded Heracles to cleanse in one day the staples of Augeas. Augeas was a king of Elis who was very rich in herds. Three thousand of his cattle he kept near the royal palace in an enclosure where the refuse had accumulated for many years. When Heracles presented himself before the king and offered to cleanse his stables in one day, provided he should receive in return a tenth part of the herds, Augeas, thinking the feat impossible, accepted his offer in the presence of his son, Phyllis. Near the palace where the two rivers, Pinius and Alpheus, the streams of which Heracles conducted into the stables by means of a trench which he dug for this purpose, and as the waters rushed through the shed, they swept away with them the whole mass of accumulated filth. But when Augeas heard that this was one of the labors imposed by Eurystheus, he refused the promised guerdon. Heracles brought the matter before a court and called Phileus as a witness to the justice of his claim, whereupon Augeas, without waiting for the delivery of the verdict, angrily banished Heracles and his son from his dominion. 
resume his post and announce his intention of being himself the bearer of the apples to Eurystheus, leaving Heracles to fill his place. To this proposal, the hero feigned assent, merrily begging that Atlas would be kind enough to support the heavens for a few moments while he contrived a pad for his head. Atlas good-naturedly threw down the apples and once more resumed his load, upon which Heracles bade him adieu and departed. When Heracles conveyed the golden apples to Eurystheus, the latter presented them to the hero, whereupon Heracles placed the sacred fruit on the altar of Athena, who restored them to the garden of the Hesperides. The twelfth and last labor which Eurystheus imposed on Heracles was to bring up Serapis from the lower world. Believing that all his heroic powers would be unavailing in the realm of shades, and that in this, his last and most perilous undertaking, the hero must at length succumb and perish. Cerebus was a monster dog with three heads, out of whose awful jaws dripped poison. The hair of his head and back was formed of venomous snakes, and his body terminated in the tail of a dragon. After being initiated into the Eleusinians' mysteries and obtaining from the priests certain information necessary for the accomplishment of his task, Heracles set out for Danarum in Laculia, where there was an opening which led to the underworld. Conducted by Hermes, he commenced his descent into the awful gulf, where myriads of shades soon began to appear all of whom fled in terror at his approach. Arrived before the gates of Hades, he found Theseus and Pirithous, who had been fixed to an enchanted rock by Hades for their presumption in endeavoring to carry off Persephone. When they saw Heracles, they implored him to set them free. He did succeed in delivering Theseus, but when he endeavored to liberate Pirithous, the earth shook so violently beneath him that he was compelled to relinquish his task. Proceeding further, Heracles recognized Ascalaphus, who, as we have seen in the story of Demeter, had revealed the fact that Persephone had swallowed the seeds of a pomegranate offered to her by her husband, which bound her to Aedes forever. Ascalaphus was groaning beneath a huge rock which Demeter, in her anger, had hurled upon him, and which Heracles now removed, releasing the sufferer. Before the gates of his palace stood Hades, the mighty ruler of the underworld, and barred his entrance. But Heracles, aiming at him with one of his nearing darts, shot him in the shoulder, so that for the first time the god experienced the agony of mortal suffering. Heracles then demanded of him permission to take Serapis to the upper world, and to this Hades consented on condition that he should secure him unarmed. Protected by his breastplate and lion skin, Heracles went in search of the monster, whom he found at the mouth of the river Achiron. Undismayed by the hideous barking which proceeded from his three heads, he seized the throat with one hand and the legs with the other, and although the dragon which served him as a tail bit him severely, he did not relinquish his grasp. In this manner, he conducted him to the upper world through an opening in Argolia. When Eurystheus beheld Serapis, he stood aghast, and despairing of ever getting rid of his hated rival, he returned the hellhound to the hero who restored him to Hades, and with this last task, the subjection of Heracles to Eurystheus terminated. Free at last, Heracles now returned to the Thebes, and it being impossible for him to live happily with Megara, in consequence of his having murdered her children, 
proceeded to Caledon, where he wooed the beautiful Dianera, daughter of the king of Aetola. But he encountered a formidable rival in Achilles, the river god, and it was agreed that their claim should be decided by single combat. Trusting to his power of assuming various forms at will, Achilles felt confident of success, but this availed him nothing. For having at last transformed himself into a bull, his mighty adversary broke off one of his horns and compelled him to acknowledge himself defeated. After passing three happy years with Dianera, an unfortunate accident occurred. Heracles was one day present at a banquet when, by a sudden swing of his hand, he had the misfortune to strike on the head of a youth of noble birth, who, according to the custom of the ancients, was serving the guests at table. And so violent was the blow that it caused his death. The father of the unfortunate youth, who had witnessed the occurrence, saw that it was the result of accident, and therefore absolved the hero from blame. But Heracles resolved to act according to the law of the land, banished himself from the country, and bidding farewell to his father-in-law, set out of Dragon to visit his friend, King Saix, taking with him his wife and his young son, Helis. In the course of their journey, they arrived at the river Evenus, over which the centaur Nisus was in the habit of carrying travelers for hire. Heracles, with his little son in his arms, forded the stream unaided, entrusting the centaur Nisus with his wife, who, charmed with the beauty of his fair burden, attempted to carry her off. But her cries were heard by her husband, who without hesitation shot Nisus through the heart with one of his poisoned arrows. Now the dying centaur was thirsting for revenge. He called Dianera to his side and directed her to secure some of the blood which flooded from his wound, assuring her that if, when in danger of losing her husband's affection, she used it in the manner indicated by him, it would act as a charm and prevent her from being supplanted by a rival. Heracles and Dianera now pursued their journey, and after several adventures at length, arrived at their destination. The last expedition undertaken by the great hero was against Eurytus to revenge himself upon this king and his sons for having refused to bestow upon him the hand of Ioli, after having fairly won the maiden. Having collected a large army, Heracles set out in order to besiege Ocalia, its capital. Success crowned his arms. He stormed the citadel, slew the king and his three sons, reduced the town to ashes, and carried away captive the young and beautiful Ioli. Returning from his victorious expedition, Heracles halted himself in order to offer a sacrifice to Zeus and sent to Deonera to Trashin for a sacrificial robe. Dianera, having been informed that the fair Ioli was in the train of Heracles, was fearful lest her youthful charms might supplant her in the affection of her husband, and calling to mind the advice of the dying centaur, she determined to test the efficacy of the love charm which he had given to her. Taking out the vial which she had carefully preserved, she imbued the robe with a portion of the liquid which it contained, and sent it to Heracles. The victorious hero clothed himself with the garment and was about to perform the sacrifice when the hot flames rising from the altar heated the poison with which it was imbued, and soon every fiber of his body was penetrated by the deadly venom. The unfortunate hero, suffering the most fearful tortures, endeavored to tear off the robe, but it adhered so closely to the skin that all his efforts to remove it only increased his agonies. In this pitiable condition, he was conveyed to Trashin, where Deonera, on beholding the terrible suffering of which she was the innocent cause, was overcome with grief 